What's going on, everybody? It's Brian Tripp. I'm here in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama. So glad you decided to join us today for another episode of the Alaria Masterclass Podcast. We're Alabama's only real estate podcast. We love to get on guests who are local to our area, but about half the time we bring on um, national guests that can give us some national perspective on what the real estate climate looks like. And today is no different. We have Mr. Jefferson Lilly with us from San Francisco, California. California. How's it going today, Jefferson? Uh, great, Brian. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm so excited. Um, we, we, we've we played around with the format a little bit. Um, so, you know, kind of our introduction has been shortened down. Just want to try to get right on into it. This is episode number 76 of our interview show. And Jefferson is a mobile home park owner, owner of how many? Parks? Uh, well, either directly or with the partnership, a total of 25 mobile home parks, just coming up on 2,300 uh, pads uh, across those 25 parks, coast to coast. Coast to coast. I, I really. Yeah. So let's let's kind of. I like to start, you know, kind of 101 and graduate up. Let Let's just yeah. kind of talk about some of that language you just used already, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, and then maybe we can talk a little bit more sophisticated. Um, what do you mean by a pad? And what do you mean by like like these parks? When when you say a mobile home park or a trailer park, it could be. Yep. I think they can be defined defined as as little as two or three mobile homes. Is could be a park. So sure, kind of explain Jefferson. How you know kind of your parks? Like are they some of them big, some of them small? And then what's a pad? And what what does all that mean? Yeah, so you can think of our business much like uh, owning parking lots. Uh, and so, you know, the pad is the, the, the parking space, if you will. Uh, I would say on average, a pad might be sort of uh, 40 feet by 80, uh, something like that. So it's big enough for a mobile home uh, to be parked on it and they get tied down. It's not literally the, the parking lot business. These things are tied down uh, to code. Uh, so they are mostly, you know, wind and tornado proof. Uh, and of course, permanent utilities are hooked up, the water, the sewer, the gas, the electric, et cetera. Um, but so that's what the actual pad is. And then I guess technically any single piece of land with two or more mobile homes on it would be considered a, a mobile home park. So we've got, again, about 25 parks, uh, a couple of those I own myself, and then about 23 are in our Park Street Partners partnership. Uh, we've, we're just shy of 2,300 pads right now. Wow. So it's somewhere around, call it basically 90 pads per park, uh, 90 parking spaces, if you will, per, per park. Uh, it's about a, about the average across our portfolio, but our smallest park is 20 spaces and our largest is 298. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I'm kind of teased the audience a little bit. We're going to get into some some specifics when it comes to mobile home parks. Most of my audience knows I have a mobile home park that's here in Birmingham, Alabama, and it's 59 spaces. And um, a lot of you guys, I've, I've talked about it a ton. It's one of the best investments I ever made. And I think it's, it's really great having someone like you on the show, Jefferson, because you can kind of give some perspective on how great of an investment mobile home park investing actually is. But before we get to that, I want to actually learn more about you, if you don't mind i'd love to know um you told me off air that you you kind of moved to silicon valley to work there and you were doing some oh, yeah. with some startups and stuff and then you kind of just this has kind of been your full-time gig doing the mobile home parks tell us your story tell us how you got from silicon valley startup guy to mobile home park investing yeah well as as i said i, I kind of went from uh, mobile uh, mobile phones to mobile homes <laughs> the, the usual career progression uh yeah, so I was working in Silicon Valley for most of my 30s, uh, basically doing sales for several different uh, startup companies. And uh, I just got to thinking that, you know, uh, I had been through the dot-com boom and bust, and I kind of got to thinking, you know, to the extent personal finance is black and white, and it's never quite that clear, but basically that Warren Buffett and all things value investing were going to be, were, were right and doing sort of dot com and high tech, biotech, solar tech, silly tech investing uh, was really not what was going to generate, you know, long term re returns. Um, you, of course, only hear about the, the one in a thousand successes right. that become a great high tech investment. On the whole, I just don't believe that that high tech returns re gives returns that, that are as good as value investing. 
and at least just for me and, and kind of my risk reward profile, I'm not comfortable, you know, placing a thousand bets and losing money on totally. 900 some odd of them <laughs> and hoping that some of the few, you know, deliver a hundred times my money. Right. And more, more power to people that can do high tech investing well, but that's not, that's not me. Uh, so anyway, so I started looking around. Uh, I, I had already shifted my investment stock market to be more value oriented. Um, and then I just started thinking, hey, I should you know, diversify out of the stock market, get into some value real estate. Uh, and I thought initially, honestly, that that would be an apartment building. Again, following Buffett's advice to stay within your circle of competence. I just figured, you know, I'd always lived in a house or an apartment building. Why don't I buy, say, an apartment building, fix it up, new, put on a new roof, some new kitchens? I, I wouldn't be the guy to be swinging the hammer, but I figured I would hire people to, you know, physically improve the apartment building and make it better for tenants, bump the rents, make it better for me. Everybody wins. That was my my vision. Uh, and then just in going onto websites like loopnet.com, I would filter for multifamily apartments. Uh, you know, in places like Birmingham, Alabama, or Omaha, Nebraska, or Ames, Iowa, I knew I wasn't going to be finding anything that looked like value in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I was already looking out in the greater Midwest. So I would see in these searches, you know, 99 apartment buildings at, you know, an eight cap, which means an unlevered 8% return on your money. And then I would see, you know, one mobile home park in the search results at, you know, a 10, 11 cap rate. So yielding much more money. And my initial response, Brian, was, you know, that's absurd. I'm not buying a friggin' trailer park. And I'd click delete and re redo the search somewhere else. Again, a Ames, Iowa or Spokane, Washington or, or Omaha, Nebraska. It probably took me, I don't know, five or ten times getting hit over the head with this asset class uh, coming up in these search results before I finally thought, you know, hey, mobile home parks are multifamily and you know, there must, if it's a legitimate reason that, that they yield so much more money, then why wouldn't I buy one? Let me start to get educated about it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I found the niche. It was part plan and part dumb luck. Um, and so again, I, I just started researching, researching it, reading books and tapes. I built up an unofficial advisory board of about 10 guys that owned mobile home parks. And so I could float deals past them and see mm -hmm. what they thought of them. Um, so it took me almost a year and a half of kind of looking and, and getting educated before I closed on my first deal. I wasn't looking full time. Uh, I was still working that day job in high tech. Um, but so after about it was about 17 months, then I had closed on my first mobile home park. And uh, uh, the rest is history, I guess, as they say. Yeah. It's a really interesting story. You, you touched on a lot of stuff there. and I took a lot of notes here that that I really want to kind of talk about dissect some of the things individually but first i can't go any further we're, we're a few minutes into this thing i can't go any further without acknowledging uh you you complimented my backdrop i want to acknowledge your backdrop tell <laughs> you t you told me what was what, what was going on offline t tell everybody kind of your your unique situations i think it's funny it's interesting oh yes yeah. so yeah so i live in a rather modest apartment uh here in the bay area we're working on getting larger uh, digs for my growing family but i've got three kids age four and under uh and so it seems when i'm in my apartment i'm never more than 10 feet from a screaming child so uh we haven't yet gotten the fancy new bay area house with its own private recording studio we'll see if we're able to pull that one off so I do most of my recording and a lot of my work right here in our new minivan, Brian. And I don't know if you have kids or not, but you'll probably, if you do, you'll probably find yourself uh, uh, with your own minivan. <laughs> so I record a lot of my podcasts just right here in, in my studio, as I call it, uh, the minivan. That is awesome. I, we, you know, in my firm, we say frugal is fun. So I, I don't have any fancy office space. There's no corner no corner office tower in in, in uh, corner office in downtown San Francisco. It's just whatever is inexpensive office space, and this is uh, quiet and uh, yeah. It works for me, so you know, it's funny. My office space is probably about the same amount per month as as your uh, if you have a note on your minivan or what a minivan <laughs> note would be. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's Birmingham versus where you guys live. But I, yeah. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I have I do have a three year old and a one year old, so I get it. Trust me, I, I more than yep. get it. Our right, we can get a little more bang for our buck out here in Birmingham though than you can in a, so I so. I have more than ten feet you know away from my kids I just right. I couldn't go any further without you know kind of letting people know 
Jefferson, you know, he's just recording from a, you know, a minivan. It's cool though. This, you, you too can live this life if you own 25 mobile home parks. Isn't it glamorous? <laughs> totally. That's awesome. Well, I really want to kind of dig into to your um, mobile home park investing. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. I, I want to kind of define a couple of things real quick though, because you, you mentioned the words and the phrase value investing probably three or four mm-hmm. times. And I want to, mm-hmm. I want you to kind of explain what that means. Yeah, so the term is certainly more applied more typically to publicly traded stocks, and your listeners can, you know, read read up on Warren Buffett, and I think in particular his book, uh, the book Snowball, is probably the best uh, bi- biography of him that both explains value investing and also, frankly, touches on a lot of his personal life. Um, but yeah, basically the idea for me is that I want to buy real estate that actually cash flows right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and can generate more cash flow relatively quickly. Um, I like to buy, as as Buffett would say, with a margin of safety. Um, I don't want to be overpaying for for assets. Uh, so, for instance, some of our mobile home parks have been bought for less than construction cost. So, in sort of public stock market parlance, that would be like less than book value. Mm-hmm. So, somebody else spent, say, a million dollars to buy the land and put it in the road tapes, uh, in the drainage ditch and the fencing and the signage and everything. And we might now buy it for $800,000 just to throw out a number. Um, so sometimes we buy literally for less than construction costs. So that is, that's a wonderful thing when, when someone else can shell out all that money to build a park and, and you buy it for less totally. than that amount of money. Um, anyway, so I use the term, and frankly, I don't have a real clear black and white definition of exactly what is value real estate. But suffice it to say, we're not doing, um, you know, sexy fix and flip type real estate. I would not consider that value. Right. Uh, again, not that you can't make money at it. It's just not my thing. But living here in the Bay Area, I see people that will pay a million dollars for a 1,000 square foot house. It obviously doesn't really cash flow, they'll go ahead and put in, I don't know, $300,000 and then try and sell it for, say, a million five, a million six. Um, so fundamentally, what, what that kind of real estate means, uh, or the implications there, are that the only way to make money is to get out of real estate. You have to flip it. You have to no longer own real estate in order to make money from it. So I think that's kind of a, a bit of a, a, a clear line of distinction there. That again, in our business with mobile home parks, done right, you do cash flow from day one, and things generally get better. And you do not have to get out of the business to make money. You can just stay in it and cash flow. So, hence, I, I use the term value real estate roughly yeah. that way. And check in with me in another six or twelve months if I have a more defined, uh, uh, definite, uh, a clearer definition of of value real estate. But certainly, I would say mobile home parks are value real estate and. Totally. Uh, at any real estate at a thousand dollars a foot and up is almost certainly not value real estate. Most of our mobile homes, Brian, we buy for somewhere around twenty or thirty dollars per square foot. So very, very different than Bay Area real estate totally. at a thousand dollars a foot. Wow, yep. I can't even like I can't even comprehend a thousand dollars a square foot like here in in our area. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. I totally agree with you. the The whole value um, investing, what we call value add. Um, you know, that's how, that's how I got my mobile home park, you know, bought it for, you know, maybe 40 cents on the dollar. And now we're, we're actually in the process of selling it for, for almost full market value. So it's, it's, it's something that's very easy to do, um, in this space, you know, as long as you find the right deal, as long as you buy it right. Um, I've been there for sure. You've also, um, Jefferson, you've name dropped Warren Buffett probably six times. Is this your, is this your hero? (laughs) Uh, you know, I'm not at all in Warren Buffett's, uh, league, but, uh, I, from a, from a personal finance standpoint and an investing standpoint, yes, you could call him my hero. Uh, I've read again, a number of books, uh, on him. I'm actually taking off tomorrow to go to Omaha. It's the, uh, 2018, uh, weekend in Omaha, the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting. There'll be 40 some odd thousand of us there, uh, just hearing, uh, Buffett and his, Wow. Uh, partner Charlie Munger uh, speak about investing, and then it's a wonderful place to meet other uh, other value investors. And again, just hear 
what they're doing, whether it's public stocks or real estate or who knows what. Um, anyway, so it, it's a really it's as it's 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 often been referred to as the Woodstock of capitalism. Uh, it is uh, a very eclectic group of people. It's not particularly Wall Street types per se. Right. It's a lot of folks just kind of plenty of regular folks that are just learning how to invest and 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 are planning for their future. And and so it's it's neat then to to meet people that have uh, done quite well in investing. I I always try and be a student and uh, learn from others. I mean, you can't really go wrong trying to learn from Warren Buffett, right? I mean, no, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And so, and that's a book, Snowball. I haven't read it. I need to. Um, I know yep. the premise of it, but I definitely need to read that. So I got that in my notes too. Let's talk about, let's kind of shift gears a little bit, if you don't mind, Jefferson. I'd love to talk about you know, maybe give some people listening uh, some how-to stuff. You know, I love actionable steps. I love, hey, you know what, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three to actually go out. If someone wanted to purchase a mobile home park, let's dive into that a little bit. I want to go back to something that you said earlier too about you kind of assembled an advisory board, so to speak. Yep. You assembled a group of people who had already done it before you, Already yep. knew the ins and outs of it. Just talk, just before we get into the how to step by step, talk about that. Talk about the importance of when you're getting started in anything, having like relying on people that have already been there before you. Yeah, that's a big plus. Um, there certainly are people across a range of niches in real estate who run conferences, and it almost seems they make more money from their conferences than from actually owning real estate. Uh, those people really should be doing conferences about how to make money with conferences <laughs> rather than having a conference on how to make money with any particular niche. Now, certainly there are conferences that, that are helpful and will give you some useful information. But where I'm going with this comment is that by assembling 10 guys that, again, owned mobile home parks and weren't selling books, tapes, weekend seminars, what have you, I felt I got very good uh, current information from people that actually own parks. Um, and so, again, I, I found those folks a range of different. Uh, some of these conferences uh, helped introduce me to some folks. Uh, but I also just started mentioning to people uh, here in San Francisco, the, the land of $1,000 a foot real estate, considering buying a and like, Nine out of 10 people gave me a book or even and had a weird sense. One in 10 and or some people would say like, hey, going up, owned a park and he did really well. That's interesting. Let me know. I might want to invest with you. Um, I had one guy at my church just say, hey, you know, my dad used to own a park. And that park sent our whole family every summer to Europe for a really nice vacation. You know, here's my dad's number. Call him. So um, it was a little bit happenstance, but I would just encourage your listeners, if they're interested in this or any niche of real estate, to just put the word out there. Start yeah. talking to people, and you'll be surprised. You know, keep keep going, but you'll you'll be surprised what you'll what you'll find and how helpful uh, people will be when sure. you make it clear what you want, which is a mentor for this particular niche of real estate, that kind of thing. Just put it out there and uh, you'll, 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 you'll find, you'll connect with, with folks that can help you. No question about it. And I do want to apologize to the listeners. You're breaking up just a little bit. I think we, we definitely got the gist of what you're saying. We just lost a little bit. But, but really, I talk about this a lot, Jefferson. You're talking about really networking, you know, honestly. Yes. Networking with the right people. Um, Put, like you said, putting it out there, letting people know what you do. You know, I say this all the time too. You know, the number one killer of small businesses is obscurity. If people don't know, even know what you do, then you know yeah. you're gonna you're gonna have a hard time. You know, doing anything. It's and I say this too. You know, it's, it'd be a shame. Like when I got started, my next door neighbor was going through foreclosure, but I was too timid to let cool. anyone know what I was doing. I had no idea they were going through foreclosure. I could have helped them, right? Yeah. And and they had no idea. I had no idea until it was way too late. And and so you you don't want to do that. You want to put it out there. Give uh, give the people listening also Jefferson just kind of some a couple other actionable things that they can do 
when it comes to networking, when it comes to actually finding that mentor? What do you say? Not besides just putting it out there, what you do, what do you actually say? What do you actually, you know, um, how do you approach people? I'm, I don't know if there's any quite black or white, you know, right well, or wrong way. How to did do you it. do I, it? I, yeah. How did you do it when you were assembling your, your, your kind of your advisory board? How did you do that? It, it just kind of, again, came up in, in conversation. I would make a point of saying, you know, to somebody, uh, I'd make a pe- point of weaving it into the conversation. So, you know, maybe it's like, hey, what'd you do with your weekend? Long time no see. You know, what have you, oh, well, you know, I, somebody else says, oh, well, I just, you know, I went up to the mountains. I went skiing. And I would say, oh, that's great. You know, we talk a little about where you skied. How was it? Was it good? I'd say, you know, you're not going to believe what I did this past weekend. You know, I like, I read a book about mobile home park investing and I made some phone calls and I'm considering buying a mobile home park, you know, and then just put it out there that way and see if somebody, again, thinks you've got a really warped sense of humor or if they come back with, oh, you know, uh, my neighbor owned one or, hey, you know, uh, I've heard of a, uh, you know, I've heard of a, a local real estate networking group. Go go there, you know, next Thursday night and, and see if you can find other people. I mean, it was that kind of thing. It, I just sort of try and have it pop up. For in sure. Conversation. Yeah. But so. And and, that, and I agree with you. Everything you're saying is awesome. But here's the thing, though. I think I think that's only half of it. Don't you have to kind of put yourself in the right place to have those kinds of conversations? Because if you're having that conversation with with your your loser buddies, that's not helping you. <laughs> right. You know. Right. But it, you right. got to be in the right kind of atmosphere as well. Yeah, uh, that's true. And uh, again, other, you know, most cities now have have a RIA, a real estate uh, investment group. And uh, I went to some of those and 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 so that helps. Uh, And I'm trying to think what else. I mean, it it just and I would suspect it's even easier today than it was kind of 11 and 12 years ago when I was getting started because there are ever more online resources and networking groups and meetups and and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, I wish I, I, I had some real specific bullet points, exactly what I said or what I did. I just kind of recall that it became important to me. Yes. So I was sort of focusing on it, if you will. Yeah. And then it just naturally comes up in conversation and it, it, it just, it just happened, Brian, but no, totally. I had 10 guys that were all willing to help me. But here's the funny thing. When you put in that kind of work and you're intentional about things, yeah. Things do start to happen, right? Yep. And, and I think that that's important. And and the reason I'm asking these questions too, if, if you guys are wondering, is because everything that Jefferson's saying right now, you can apply that not just to um, mobile home park investing, not just to even if you're looking for single family houses, you can apply that to looking for fi- uh, finding private money. These are the sure. exact exact same conversation I have dropping little, you know, nuggets here and there when I'm in the right room and the right circles among the right people. Oh, what did you do this weekend? You know, I'm um, we're working on this this project where we got about 3 or 4, you know, investors that have kind of funded this thing and we're doing da da da. So all these kinds of things are so important and I always say the the most important thing when it comes to real estate and probably business in general is networking and and growing yep. your network. Um, I just I just don't think that there's anything that's more important than that and being intentional about it. So let's Jefferson real quick before we go. I want to I want to kind of do maybe a step one, step two, step three. If the, yep. you might agree that the step one is going to be a, kind of assembling two, three, four, five people who have done it before you try to, you know, uh, get mentored, whether you're searching online, um, you know, talk, whether you contact Jefferson, whoever it is, um, that's probably step one, right? You want to really kind of put it out there, what you're doing, look at stuff. Um, would you agree with that? I would. Yeah. So where do you go from there? Maybe I've looked at a bunch of stuff on LoopNet. There's also another great website out there. It's called mobilehomeparkstore.com, mobilehomeparkstore.com. It's a great resource as well for, I think it's probably the number one uh, place for listings for mobile home parks. I looked at a bunch of stuff. I made a bunch of phone calls to some sellers and uh, you didn't really know what I was saying. What's step two, Jefferson? What do I do next if I think I might've identified something that I want to move forward with? Yeah, I think finding... Uh, and actually approaching uh, park owners, if you're looking for a more focused area, like you're looking, you know, in your city or within to just be, uh, again, making contact, mail a postcard, 
make some follow-up phone calls if you can get on the road and go drive the speed bumps, as it were, drive into the parks. Um, all of that should help you. <coughs> Excuse me. All of that should help you actually make contact with park owners um, and try and bond with them. Come across as being their, you know, long lost grandchild or what have you, or son or grandson, and you know, like just get to know them and 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 try and get them to see you as the successor to their business when they're ready to sell. It might not be today. But, you know, again, you, you put it out there enough and park owners know other park owners. They might share your name with other uh, park owners. Uh, hopefully that that would pay good dividends and you can find a, a, a park uh, at a fair price that's off market, so to speak. Um, it's not broker or off some of those websites as well. Uh, but probably you'll find your best deals if, if you go direct to the park owners. Yeah. No, I. I think that it's, I mean, there's so many similarities. We talk a lot about single family residences on the show that there's, yep. it's the same thing. You know, I have, a, I have a mobile home park and the way I got it is somebody called a We Buy Houses sign. A mom and pop uh, called a We Buy Houses sign. I mean, are you kidding me? So it's, it's, this, it's the same kind of stuff. It's You're developing rapport with someone, getting them to trust you. I do want you to kind of expand a little bit more on what you were saying about parks are a little bit different in the sense that the seller especially a mom and pop, like an off market thing. If you're not buying it from a, from an institution, um, you're buying it from a mom and pop that have probably had this for generations, at least a generation. Yeah. It's, it's their baby, so to speak. And expand on what you were talking about there. Like really like letting them kind of see you as like the heir apparent as the one to take it over. Cause that's exactly what happened with me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of, of, uh, I would start with some very open-ended questions, uh, I would not delve into, you know, exactly how much money did you make last year? I'd just start off saying, you know, how did you get into this business? This this is an unusual business, isn't it? You know, how did you get started? And tell me about some of your more colorful tenants over the years. Um, uh, you know, how do you market your park? How do how do new tenants hear about your park? Proud of about your park? Uh, ask sort of more open-ended questions. And again, don't, uh, don't be shy to talk at least some about yourself. I would not advise raising issues of, you know, politics or religion, uh, or the real third rail stuff, sports. <laughs> but, <laughs> Can but be, especially just, in the deep South. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, but, um, but just kind of talk generally about yourself and a little bit about your family, why you're interested in buying a mobile home park, how you'd like, you know, what you might do with their park. Uh, you know, is there room for, for fix up? Would you be the one actually repairing some of the homes or do you know somebody who could, how nice would you make the homes for new tenants? How nice would you keep, you know, the lawns mowed? Would you repave the park? Um, mom and pop sellers will probably have a lot of pride, uh, in their park and they don't want to probably, even if they get just quote unquote, a pile of cash at closing, versus sell or carry, uh, but, but they're still going to feel like they don't want to sell the park to somebody that's just sort of going to trash totally. it and no let doubt. the trees, you know, go to pot and let no the doubt. roads go to pot and whatnot. So, you know, just kind of talk a little bit about anything else you've maintained. I don't know, were, were you a kid who mowed lawns? Do you know how to keep lawns clean, uh, you know, and nice? Have you ever worked on a road crew and done paving? Or do you know a buddy who can? I mean, those kind of things, just to, to let them know that you care about the park and the residents, um, I think would go a long way to, to, to bonding with them. Again, whatever the niche is, mobile home park or, or otherwise. Totally. That, that those kind of conversations would help you. For sure. Jefferson, so um, mobile home parks specifically, what are some things if we are going to maybe go to the next step, we feel like we got a good deal. It seems like it's a good deal and I want to move forward. What are some things that I should be looking out for that are kind of mobile home park specific that are either good or bad? Utilities kind of come to mind for me. <laughs> utilities do, yes. Uh, we prefer to buy parks that are on all city utilities, city water, city sewer. Uh, it's not to say we wouldn't do something on well or septic, but we, we prefer all city. And that's my advice first time buyers you really don't want to run the risk of having a septic system go bad. You know, that could be uh, three grand a pad, maybe even five grand a pad, depending on how much work would need to be done to try and correct a septic problem. Um, 
anyway, so we just advise buying all city utilities, at least for your first park. And then another key question is how many of the mobile homes do, are you going to own? Uh, the quote unquote perfect park, we have yet to see it, but the, the absolute perfect park, uh, among other things, would have tenants that own all their own mobile homes. So we, again, prefer to run our parks as parking lots where we only maintain the land, not any of those proverbial leaky toilets and leaky roofs. Totally. So uh, that's a key question. You will have a lot of mom and pop who own a lot of the mobile homes. That's not specifically a deal killer, but it's going to impact your capital budget because probably those homes are, are probably being rented. Uh, and we call parks with a lot of rental units that mom and pops own. We sort of call those horizontal apartment buildings. And we prefer the business model, again, of a parking lot. Mm -hmm. So you just need to understand if you're buying a park that is a you know proverbial horizontal apartment building, that you're going to have to spend some capital rehabbing those homes. The renters will turn over. The renters will do damage. You will need to fix those homes. Again, it could be three to five grand per mobile home. Uh, and then we would advise only putting them out then on a rent to own agreement. So you'll only be looking for a buyer, somebody with probably on an older home, a thousand dollars down, maybe two thousand. Um, but the idea then is just be aware if, if there are a lot of, of part, we call them park owned homes. Uh, as opposed to resident-owned homes, there are a lot of park-owned homes. You got to have some additional capital budget because those things will bounce back to you. They will need rehab, but then try and get out of the uh, the housing business, as it were. Yes. Sell those homes off. Totally. And 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 navigate the park forward. It'll take several years, but navigate it over two, three, four years to being a parking lot where you own none of the homes. But again, if you get caught along the way and you don't have enough cash to rehab those homes, you're in some trouble because now you're going to have vacancy because people generally aren't going to move into a beat up home. And certainly you aren't generally going to get responsible tenants that would want to move into a real fixer home. So right. hire a fair amount additional capital if there are a lot of park owned homes that you'll be taking over. Um, so just be aware of that. Don't get don't get yourself high centered, so to speak, or stuck partway through a transition because yet another mobile home has come up that needs to be renovated for three or five grand. Yeah. Uh, just go go into these deals with, with your eyes wide open, especially around how many homes you're going to own versus homes that are already owned by tenants. Totally agree. Um, this guys, this is kind of an industry that it's it's difficult. I think with wholesaling, it's kind of, you know, you can listen to a lot of podcasts and you can watch some YouTube videos and kind of get it and go do. This is, I feel like this is an industry, Jefferson, that takes a lot of studying. It, it, ta it takes a lot of um, know-how before you, especially, you know, with the purchase prices, um, you know, especially if you're getting, you know, 50, 80, 100 pads park. Mm -hmm. The purchase prices are up there as well. Um, this isn't something that that I feel like you can just go and do. You, I, I spent you. You said you spent some time. Was it seventeen or eighteen months? I spent like three years looking for my first park. And yep. this isn't just something that you could just listen to a podcast and oh, you know, I got it. Um, so, so definitely, I want to kind of you know set the expectations for people listening. But I do think if if you're brand new to it and you've never heard about this at all, or maybe heard about it and yep. didn't know anything, I think this is a good kind of introductory type of thing. Jefferson, can you kind of break down, you said you have um, 25 parks coast to coast. Mm -hmm. Do you have any parks over here on the East Coast, maybe a little bit further south? And, and talk about that for a second. I'm interested to know. Yeah, so we don't yet own anything in Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, we are coast to coast. Most of our stuff's in the Midwest. Yeah, uh, Wichita, Kansas is really sort of our, our geographic center, and we do own about 560 pads there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're one of the largest operators in Wichita. Um, but as far as coastal, uh, East Coast, you asked, we are uh, in uh, Raleigh-Durham. Mm -hmm. We're about 15 minutes from Duke and 15 minutes from Chapel Hill. We've got a nice 93 space park there. Uh, and then we do also own um, 
uh, down in Lakeland, Florida. That's about halfway between Tampa and Orlando. Mm-hmm. So not, none of our parks are literally on the beach, right. uh, but obviously North Carolina and Florida do have beaches. Those are coastal states. Yeah. Um, and then over here on the West Coast, we're up in Spokane, Washington. Oh, wow. Uh, again, not exactly on the beach, but uh, Washington has has beach. So that's uh, th- those are our coastal properties. But most everything, again, is more uh, Michigan, Ohio, Kansas, um, Oklahoma, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Wyoming. Uh, we're, we're about 85% Midwest and maybe about 15 percent has been invested, uh, in a coastal state. And I guess Alabama would be coastal, Brian, cause you guys have got beaches. So. You know, Florida, Florida took, uh, most our beach. If you look at a map, <laughs> maybe, yeah, but, uh, the, yeah. So, um, before we go though, like explain why you, and, and I've heard this from a lot of people, why is that Midwest Great Plains area the sweet spot for mobile home parks? Yeah, so you've got uh, the combination of more affordable real estate, uh, which is to say, certainly for smaller parks, you can still buy them at maybe a nine or a ten cap. Um, so, so the real estate's you know much more affordable, certainly much more so than here in California where I live, um, and uh, there's just something about folks more in the Midwest and the towards Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota and whatnot, folks tend to take better care of their homes. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, and the parks have a higher degree of resident owned homes, again, as opposed to park owned. Mm-hmm. So you just tend to get a more responsible renter on the whole. Um, frankly, where you are in, in the South, you tend to have less responsible renters um, and actually a lot of parks, as I understand it, and I, I don't own anything in the South again. Well, I guess you could, I guess you can consider Raleigh Durham to be in the South, but, um, eh. but, but a lot of the, <laughs> eh, yeah, well, they're not quite Northerners, but yeah, sort of, um, Just kidding. but, uh, uh, but a lot of the parks in the Southeast, as I understand it, and I'll be interested to hear about the infrastructure in your park, but I think far more parks in the Southeast uh, are on city, uh, sorry, well water hmm. and septic or even sewage lagoon. Mm-hmm. So I think the infrastructure on average is uh, less good in the southeast than uh, more generally in the Midwest and especially the up, upper Midwest, again, kind of getting yeah. towards uh, Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota. Right. And not. Is your park on all city utilities or what it, have you got? It is. Um uh, I'm on all city, I'm city water, city sewer. I'm downtown Birmingham. We're the only park in uh downtown area. What the, the, what I've heard and, and I've, I haven't heard that, but I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of truth to what you just said, but what I've heard about the deep South, the Southeast in particular, you know, you start talking about Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee and Georgia, um, and Louisiana in particular, um, these parks have very low lot rents. And, yep. and it's just, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. And, and like you said, the tenant base is going to be a little bit, a little bit tougher. So, and yep. then, and then the parks just for the most part, just don't look as good. What, yep. what happens more out here is, and what, what's very common, a lot more common when you start getting to the suburbs of Alabama, you know, kind of out outside of our main County, the kind of the periphery counties, you see the people with a mobile home on an acre of land, with you know a nice yep. double wide or even a single wide, but a nice mobile home that they probably paid thirty to fifty thousand for, and they put it on an acre of land. So yep. you don't get as many parks out there. You get more of the people that just want that you know want the land. So yep. it's interesting. Well, Jefferson, I can't thank you enough. Um, if if someone were to you know want to get a hold of you, I don't know, maybe add you to their quote unquote advisory board, learn a little bit more from you about mobile home park investing. How could they do that? Yeah, so we run uh, the industry's first and largest podcast just dedicated to mobile home park investing. Uh, It's simply called Mobile Home Park Investors. Folks can find that by going to to the website, mobilehomeparkinvestors.com. That will link them through to our podcast. We also have a LinkedIn group with 4,000 some odd members trading deal flow and advice. Cool. Uh, and so they can also, again, get, get there from mobilehomeparkinvestors.com. And they, we also run the industry's calendar of events. So folks can, again, from that website, download upcoming 
trade shows and events. Um, and then secondly, uh, anybody that uh, might want to consider investing with us and co-owning mobile home parks in one of our funds, uh, they can find us through our parkstreetpartners.com website, parkstreetpartners.com. And then I believe at the bottom of the homepage, there's a button that simply says view current investments. Uh, that'll prompt you to input your email address. It'll give you information about uh, some of our, our, our investments. Um, and then again, you'll be on our mailing list and be appraised of upcoming deals and funds. So part uh, is, is the other way to find us. That's awesome. I didn't know that you had all that. That's really cool. And you mentioned your podcast. I'm going to get to be a guest on that podcast. I'm, I'm excited are. about that. We'll record that show next, Brian. Yeah, we're about to record it right after this one. And so, um, guys, yep. be on the lookout for that. I'll link that up here um, hopefully soon. by the time this one comes out. Hopefully that'll be very soon. I'll get that linked up to our site. And and uh, you guys can check, check me out on his as well. And then get in touch with Jefferson if you guys have any questions about mobile home. That that podcast sounds awesome. I've not listened to it yet, and I definitely um, i am excited to um, learn more about mobile home parks from you. Yeah, that'll be great. It's all there. Awesome, man. Thank you so much, Jefferson. I really do appreciate your time and appreciate you coming on the show. Um, any parting words? I know you like to ask for favorite quotes. you have a, a favorite quote, a parting word that you would like to give our, our audience? Uh, I do. Uh, I think it was Henry Ford who said, if you think you can, you're correct. If you think you can't, you're correct. <laughs> so just uh, getting your head wrapped around, uh, you know, being successful in, in whatever facet of your life, just you know, ha having a positive attitude and figuring out how to do things because you can That's just awesome. having, I think, a correct mental mental attitude uh, uh, will pay big dividends in, in whatever facet of your life. So think you can. That's awesome. I could not agree with that more. It's incredible. Guys, hit that subscribe button. We love you guys so much for tuning in every single week. We'll see you next time.